In Acts chapter 9, we see the real beginning of the story of Saul of Tarsus. After a brief look at the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the beginnings of the church in Samaria, we get back into the real story of Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we read, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there, blind, for three days, and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, Ananias exclaimed, I have heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls on your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in a synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? They asked. And didn't he come here to arrest them and to take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. But Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus, and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Saul stayed with the disciples and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him on his way to Tarsus, his hometown. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. Let me read that last verse again. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. Then the church had peace. Honestly, I felt like this verse should have been located up around verse 19. Paul goes on a mission to kill off the followers of Jesus in Damascus. Along the way, God himself intervenes and Paul turns from being a persecutor to a follower. In the city of Damascus, a Christian named Ananias prays for him and the scales fall from his eyes. This is where I would think we would find the verse. Then the church had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. It had peace, it became strong, and it grew in numbers because Paul had joined their side. Right? Wrong. 
it had peace, it became strong, and it grew in numbers because Paul got out of the way. After he became a believer, Paul immediately began preaching in Damascus. He ended up stirring up trouble, and for fear of his life, they sent him on to Jerusalem. Here, he meets Peter and James, and also, again, stirs up trouble for himself with his preaching. This time, they pack him away in a boat to his hometown. It is only then that the church experienced peace, became strong, and grew in numbers. It will be many years after being sent away before Paul is ready to return to the public eye as the Paul we love and know today. In many ways, Paul was the first true celebrity convert for the early church. Here is an educated, articulate, well-known public figure who had a major dramatic conversion and as a result had just an even greater passion to preach the very message he had zealously been trying to snuff out only days before. Imagine how we would treat his conversion today. This is front page news type stuff. This is major media circuit than 700 Club feature. Authors would be clamoring to write his biography. Mega churches would be scrambling to slot him as a guest speaker. This is a God-given opportunity and we need to make the absolute most of it before the shine starts to wear off, right? No? There is something that needs to be said for discipleship before leadership. When God wanted to lead the Hebrew people from slavery to the Promised Land, he first led Moses out into the desert for 40 years. After God anointed David as the next king of Israel, he then had this boy spend 25 years mostly as an exile and outcast before having him ascend to the throne. And when God commissioned Paul as his missionary to the Gentiles, he first sent him to Tarsus. Today, Tarsus is a little town halfway between two other, much larger cities that are both popular vacation spots. About 25 kilometers to the west, you have the beachside city of Mercy. About 30 kilometers in the other direction lies the lakefront metropolis of Vedana. There's nothing special about the city of Tarsus. There never really was. It was first a frontier town for the Hittites, then the Assyrians, and the Persians. For all these empires, it was about as far from the center of power as one could get. Alexander took it during his campaigns, and after his death, it became a part of the Seleucid Empire. For a while, it became an important place of learning. Those who weren't good enough or couldn't afford to go to the Ivy League schools in Athens or Alexandria came here instead. Finally, Pompey took the city and added it to the Roman Empire. Because this city, so far from Rome, seemed extraordinarily loyal, and because it was a safe little spot to make a positive public example of such loyalty, the residents of Tarsus received citizenship in 66 BC. This is still about the state of things when Paul returned home after his conversion. It was still a good little city, a second-rate educational center, a regional capital, though that region had been divided some time earlier and Tarsus was already being eclipsed by its growing neighbor, Adana. It was far from places of action and government, far from this new religion that Paul had joined, even far from trade or educational centers. This is where Paul spent a large majority of the 14 years after his hasty retreat from Jerusalem until his return to the same city with Barnabas. We live in a world of the urgent and the rushed. The concept of waiting for the right time, the right moment, is something that seems ever more foreign to us. We would rather throw some stale leftovers into the microwave than wait for the pot roast simmering to perfection in the crock pot. Once upon a time, we had to wait a week for each new 30-minute episode of our favorite TV show. Now, we binge-watch entire seasons online because a week is far too long to wait. And reading the book instead? Who has time for that? How would you handle it if God were to say to you, I'm not ready to use you. You're not ready to be used. I'm going to need you to take a decade or four in some out-of-the-way backwater as a shepherd of real sheep not people, before you can handle the calling I've placed on you. One day, you will replace your boss and really make something of this company. But first, I'm going to need you to be the office whipping boy for, oh, say, 25 years or so. Then you'll have the humility needed to handle the responsibility. We have a drive, a longing to always do everything right here, right now. In many ways, this is a good thing. It is good to have a passion. It is good to want to make a difference, but are we wanting to do so so that we might be seen and known and admired, or are we doing it for his glory? 
A success in God's eyes ended up looking exactly the opposite of what the world understands as success, would we still be striving for it? If getting God's attention required the world forgetting all about us, would we still want it? The church had peace. It became strong and it grew in numbers only after Paul got out of the way. Are we willing to get out of the way? Perhaps not just our egos, but even our actual physical presence, if that's what it takes for the church we know and love to have peace, to become strong, and to grow.